Now on BBC Two, in a change to the scheduled edition, tonight's decisive weapon is the saviour of the US bombers, the P-51 Mustang. Europe, 1943. The Allies gamble everything on a daylight bombing campaign on Nazi Germany by the US 8th Air Force. It's a gamble they are losing. Wave after wave of enemy fighters attack the unescorted bombers. In mid-1943, the 8th Air Force was basically being shot out of the sky. While the RAF bomb at night, the Americans are certain they can achieve greater accuracy by bombing in daylight. But without the cover of darkness, the lumbering bombers are easy prey for German fighters. The Americans had believed their B-17 flying fortresses to be impregnable. They are wrong. We found out, much to our dismay, that the vaunted uh, firepower of the B-17 still not enough to uh, uh, protect us from a, uh, a concentrated attack of uh, German fighters. The daylight bombing campaign is threatened with failure, and with it, the most effective means of taking the war to Germany. What the Americans need is a fighter that can match the bomber's range of up to 1,400 miles, match the bomber's altitude of 35,000 feet, and after that, take on the Luftwaffe. In 1943, only one fighter has the combination of range and performance to save the daylight bombing campaign. The story of the Allied victory in the air over Germany is the story of the P-51 Mustang. If you want to go to Berlin and mix it up with the enemy and be able to keep him off the bomber stream and engage the Luftwaffe and shoot it down, it was the P-51. There was no other fighter. Well, I felt that I, I had about the best weapon that was available. The state of the art was right where I'd like to see it. Everything that makes a good fighter was right at our fingertips. It was uh, truly the sport car of its era. At the time, I felt like I was the, one of the luckiest pilots in the, in, the, uh, in the Air Force to be able to fly the Mustang. It was the greatest. <laughs> the Mustang, the savior of the American air war, began life in 1940. Ironically, it was the British who inspired it. A massive order by the RAF had led to North American aviation designing a brand new fighter. Combining the very latest design methods and state-of-the-art technology, the end product was named the P-51. We were in the middle of trying to be an isolationist nation. We were not going to go to war in Europe. So, had it not been for the British buy of these airplanes, uh, the U.S. probably never would have had the P-51. And um, as is, is typical of the British flair for naming things, they named it the Mustang. The P-51 Mustang, with its killing potential, has brought new hope to a besieged Britain. The RAF, when they took delivery of this aircraft late in 1941 and early in 42, used it for supporting the army, tactical fighter, shooting up the enemy on the ground and uh, photo reconnaissance at low level. It was a beautifully streamlined aerodynamic airframe, but it had this Allison engine. The Allison engine was a damn good engine at low altitude, but it had no supercharging. And unfortunately, above 15,000 feet, power fell off, and it was no match for any German interceptor of its day. The Mustang needed just one addition to make it a true thoroughbred. That addition came courtesy of the British. Fortunately, a couple of people who were somewhat influential in British production managed to fly the airplane. 
And one of them, uh, Ronnie Harker from Rolls-Royce, said, let's put a Merlin on this thing. The British-made Merlin engine, produced by Rolls-Royce, had a peerless reputation for power and performance. It was the same engine used in the Spitfire. The supercharged Merlin now enabled the P-51 to double its altitude. It could now fly as high as the American bombers at 40,000 feet, six miles up in the sky. There was a quantum improvement with the introduction of the, of the Rolls-Royce Merlin. And does anything sound any better than that Rolls-Royce Merlin? That dude just hums. It's just a lovely engine to, to listen to. Doesn't sound too bad inside the cockpit either. Uh, the Mustang cockpit is extremely well organized. A pilot can just reach blindly and get the controls fairly quickly. This is the throttle. It's probably one of the finest feeling throttles in any airplane. Everybody who flies a Mustang loves this great handful of throttle. The stick. Up here at the top is machine guns or bombs, depending on which it has a trigger on the front and a button on the top, and you can use one for guns, one for bombs. Down here is the fuel management system. The flying instruments are well organized, straight in the front of the pilot. Altitude, airspeed, compass, turn and bank, propeller control, mixture control. At the left side are the flaps, all the trims, elevator, aileron, rudder. I've really covered most of what a pilot does in this airplane that quickly. It is that easy to manage. Not only is the airplane simple inside, it's simple outside. The tail, straightforward and simple, with a balanced, mass-balanced elevator. Any World War II airplane is going to require a large rudder uh, because the, the uh, torque on the propeller is so intense and so massive, he's going to need a lot of this to help him. As you can see, this flap is massive, and of course the whole idea is to slow the airplane down enough so you can land it. Of course, 50 caliber guns went up in here. Excellent firepower in 650 caliber guns. Nice, thin, laminar flow wing. The whole idea, I can actually get my hand around the cord of this wing, the thickness. Uh, the thinner the wing, the faster it will go. Enormous four-bladed propeller in front, Hamilton standard propeller. 11 feet, 2 inches in diameter. It is a massive gyroscope, and the only way to control this thing is either with your hand or your feet. Uh, the hand being the throttle and your feet being the rudder. Of course, the great Merlin engine, that's what makes the airplane what it was in World War II. Uh, this high-altitude engine de developed and designed by the British, built by the Packard Motor Car Company under license in the U.S., made the Mustang the long-range fighter and the high-altitude fighter that it was. I was 22, and at 22, uh, one likes the good lines of, of uh, machinery, uh, young ladies, but the P-51 simply had a class of all its own. It was a beauty to behold. In 1942, despite the high performance of the Mustang, America's Air Force commanders saw little use for it. They put their faith in the bombers of the 8th Air Force, principally the B-17 Flying Fortress. It was aptly named the Fortress, with its nine gun positions, power-operated gun turrets, and twin 50 caliber machine guns. Their belief in the firepower of the bombers was so great, they saw no need for fighter escort, even bombing in daylight. The Luftwaffe would quickly teach them a lesson. What they needed was a long-range fighter to escort the bombers. The Spitfire had the performance, but its fuel capacity was tiny. The US Air Force turned to the P-47 Thunderbolt, a powerful and rugged fighter. But despite its large fuel tank, it just didn't have the range to go all the way with the bombers. Well, after the P-47s had to turn around and go home, and we were out there all alone, then uh, about all we could do was uh, 
tuck it in, as we called it, and fly the closest formation we possibly could to concentrate the uh, defensive fire. Because any stragglers or any strays were an easy kill for the German fighters. Their ground control knew almost to the mile where the American escort would have to turn around and go back. And within five minutes, uh, the bombers could count on being hit by the, the German fighters and, uh, and, and mauled uh, mercilessly uh, from then until the target and back. They really knew our tactics, our capabilities, and our limitations. After a particularly disastrous raid on Schweinfurt in October 1943, the American bombers were forced to restrict their targets to the range of their fighter escorts. The Luftwaffe ruled the skies over Germany. Some people think that by 1943, with the Americans in the war, it was all but over, but it was far from the case. If anything, the Luftwaffe was actually getting the better of the bomber forces. The solution which saved the American daylight bombing campaign proved deceptively simple. Disposable fuel tanks made of a laminated paper compound. Slung under the wing, they could more than double a fighter's fuel load. The two leading fighters in use in 1943, the Spitfire and the Thunderbolt, couldn't support the weight of the extra fuel, but the Mustang could. With over 200 gallons of extra fuel, the Mustang could now fly anywhere in occupied Europe. When we acquired the 108-gallon laminated paper fuel tanks, that gave the Mustang the long legs to go anywhere in Germany uh, with the bombers, have loitering time. Uh, in fact, it was truly the turning point of the air war in Europe. As long as you had no uh, enemy fighter aircraft, it was much easier to approach a bomber formation uh, than uh, with fighter um, uh, fighter escort. So the, the moment the Americans or the British came with fighter escort, it was bad. The U.S. Air Force had blasted a fighter with the range, the altitude, and the performance to protect its bombers. All they needed now was enough of the new Mustangs. What America was able to do better than any other single country was mass produce its products. Uh, we simply took the automobile industry and turned it into one large production engine for the war. Uh, the United States built just short of 300,000 airplanes in World War II. Uh, that's almost the same number as everybody else put together. Uh, it's a phenomenal amount. Equipped with a fighter which could protect the bombers and take on the Luftwaffe, it now fell to American pilots to prove the Mustang in combat. Men like fighter ace Don Blakesley. Don Blakesley was the single man responsible for standing up and saying, let me have this airplane. He was responsible for integrating the Mustang into the theater with the 354th group. He helped them get ready for combat, and then he asked for the airplane as well. I felt it from the first time I saw the airplane, the first time I flew it, and the way it handled. And when I knew I could go any place, and I mean this sincerely, there wasn't a place that I couldn't go in the enemy territory. That was it. All of a sudden, he had an airplane, as he said, had seven league boots. It could go to Berlin, and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get out there, way out there, and never, ever have to turn away from the bombers. He wanted to go all the way with them, so when the bombers turned around, he would turn around, but not until then. And this airplane did that for him. In 51, we were actually seeking enemy because we knew that it proved it. Numbers didn't mean anything. Range didn't mean anything. Go get him. On the morning of March the 4th, 1944, Blakesley got his wish to go all the way with the bombers to Berlin, the heart of the Third Reich, a target never before attempted in daylight. So in this particular mission, we're going to Berlin and everybody's making a big fuss about it, particularly the media. They, oh my God, here we go. The hard part of the thing was the weather wasn't particularly good. 
The journey to Berlin and back was 1300 miles, a seven hour flight. The weather was so bad that half of the force had to turn back. But Blakesley pushed on, determined to tackle the Luftwaffe over the Nazi capital. I got on the one, and I got on his tail. Close, close, close. I had him cold turkey. And the guns didn't fire. You can imagine what I thought. I, I flew up beside him. And there's been stories saying that I waved and he waved. He wasn't about to wave. If he'd have waved, I'd have rammed him. Blakesley's guns had iced over in the high-altitude cold. Teething troubles like this were inevitable in these early long-range missions. The March 4th mission had been little more than a dry run. On March the 6th, just two days after the first raid, the 8th Air Force returned to Berlin with one of the largest air armadas ever assembled. bombers stretched over 30 miles of sky and with them their Mustang escorts. The March 6 mission to Berlin was something of a turning point because it proved that the escort fighters could not only go all the way with the bombers, they could certainly do a good job in protecting them and destroying the enemy fighters and they had to fight hard because the enemy, as it was his capital that was being attacked, put up his total air force, everything that he could muster. In the ensuing air battle, a section of bombers was separated from its fighter escort. Swarming into the gap, the Luftwaffe fighters shot down 42 bombers. Where the Mustangs were present, it was the Luftwaffe they got shot out of the sky. 87 German planes were destroyed, one-fifth of the force that had attacked the bombers. Huge damage was inflicted on the... On the 6th of March and saw red-nosed Mustangs, and they would have been Blakeleys, over Berlin and said, the war is lost. These stories get around, but certainly that must have been the feeling of a lot of Luftwaffe commanders when they suddenly saw single-seat fighters of their enemy over Berlin, something that would have been thought impossible two or three years earlier. The sky was full of enemies, and we had to fight them. The Mustang was, was better in every respect. In, it was better in every respect. Maneuverability was better, cruising speed was higher, acceleration was higher. No chance against the Mustang. With the Mustang riding high over German skies, a new generation of fighter aces emerged. Blakesley, by now a legend, was decorated by Eisenhower himself. But while some were glorified, other American pilots, ignored by the media of the day, were also making their mark in Mustangs. None more so than the squadron known as the Red Tails, or simply the Tuskegee Airmen. The Tuskegee Airmen evolved as a result of a good deal of effort and controversy in the military. It was traditionally uh, believed by the military that Negroes or blacks were not to be given any technical roles for their contribution, merely menial work. Well, with the pressures that were exerted on Congress and the military, they opened up the Air Corps for admission to the blacks in there. And this experiment was expected to fail. Well, unfortunately, they provided so many obstacles that they didn't get anything but the cream of the crop. And the cream of the crop were not about to give in to the expectations of the bigotry that existed. Fifth mission was a tour of duty when we arrived uh, uh, Naples, Italy. I flew 107 missions on, during a four-month period. Since there were no black replacement pilots, we continued to fly because we knew this was an experiment and we had not planned for it to fail. 
we establish a record that, to my knowledge, has never been equaled or surpassed in any war. We never lost a bomber to enemy air action. I've heard many stories that some were reluctant that we escorted them early on, but that later on they said they better get these red tails to escort them. The, the Mustang was a, a powerful weapon in our hands also, and that uh, it gave us a chance uh, to prove ourselves as uh, a many-rolled fighter outfit. The 332nd shot down or damaged 409 German aircraft. That's not too bad for an outfit that the Army Air Corps said uh, couldn't learn to fly, and if they did learn to fly, they didn't have the courage to fight in combat. Convinced by the Mustang's extraordinary performance, the U.S. Air Force now found new ways to exploit the capabilities of their war-winning machine. The American bombing depended on visual sighting on a target that was five miles below. And how many days can you find visual conditions in Northwest Europe? Very few. But what helped was to send out scouting Mustangs way ahead of the bombers who could report back by radio on the conditions that actually existed over target. We were the eyes of the bomber force commander. Ahead of the bombers, about 40, 45 minutes ahead of anybody else, to report back what the weather was like, what the target conditions were like, what the, where the enemy aircraft were forming up, what the flak was like. So if the primary target was covered up with smoke screens or with weather, we could divert the bombers to a secondary target. John Brooks and several others saw the necessity for this kind of mission, and the Mustang was probably the only airplane that could really do it. It was maneuverable, it had firepower, it had range, and as a result, it was ideal for the mission. My little scouting force got a few victories, not a lot because that wasn't our job. But the thing that my scouting force is most famous for, I just had one wingman, just one fella, and uh, he and I uh, had been to the target and done our job and came on the way back and a gaggle of uh, Germans were heading toward the bombers. I called it 75. The bombers said there was 125 of them. We compromised with 100 enemy and my wingman and I shot five of them at that time. And one of the fighter squadrons that I called on the radio came up and got 34 kills out of the remaining airplanes in the air. The older I get, the braver I was. In keeping the German fighters away from the American bomber formations, they gradually began to achieve something which was never thought possible, air superiority over the enemy homeland. And that in itself was a war-winning feat. It enabled Eisenhower to say on the morning of D-Day, if you see any aircraft over the beaches, they're going to be ours and they were. They didn't even want to take leave. They wanted to fly. I think they felt, well, hell, this is a turkey shoot. And we're not the turkey. Destroying the enemy in the air was no longer enough. While the bombers headed home, the Mustangs would loiter over Germany, wreaking havoc. Eighth Air Force General Hap Arnold instructed his Mustang pilots, get them in the air, get them on the ground, just get them. Uh, we would fly escort and we'd, we'd stay with them until we reached back about the, uh, the Dutch border. And we'd go back looking for targets of opportunity, uh, airfields, uh, transportation targets, what have you, and go down and strafe. They went down and looked for trains or barges on the river or um, uh, any uh, enemy installations such, such as airfields and uh, wherever we could find a suitable target. We were turned loose. That was playtime. It was a great thrill to hit uh, an airfield and, and blow the planes up, or to hit a uh, a uh, transportation target, to hit a uh, locomotive, and see the steam uh, the steam blow. We'd go down on the deck, and if it moves, well, you kill it. You have the ammunition. You paid a hell of a lot to get that ammunition over there. Don't bring it home. We got a lot more at home. Ground strafing, however, was not without its hazards. Anti-aircraft fire shot down more Mustangs than the Luftwaffe. 
In fact, uh, that's the nastiest job in the whole business. We lost more people on groundwork than aerial work. But the point is, <laughs> someone said, that's how you earn your hazard pay. Whether 100 feet off the ground or six miles up in the sky, the Mustang was turning the course of the war. The number of victories over the enemy increased to a point where the Luftwaffe was hard put to put up a formation to engage the American bombers. And on some days, they just didn't try. Once it had been the hunter of the American bombers, now it was the hunted of the American fighters. I just knew that if we kept on doing what we're doing, uh, they were bound to know that uh, you don't fool around with P-51s. And I think they learned that. It was our salvation, and all of us will, uh, bomber pilots will bow down and take off our hats to the pilots that were trained to fly. And that look at the P-51 Mustang replaced tonight's scheduled edition of Decisive Weapons.